We just finished a great series in Hebrews. God's word is powerful. It's living and life transforming. Proverbs 22, 6 says, direct your children onto the right path. When they're older, they will not leave it. Now, before we get into this family series, we're focusing a lot on parenting. I cannot speak to every single situation here. If you are longing to be a parent, have lost a child, raising grandchildren, you're struggling. Like, I can't speak to all of those things, but the Holy Spirit can. So come, still with expectation. We're going to talk a lot about leadership, and parenting is leadership. It's discipleship. So God wants to meet you in those things. So if you hear family and parenting, do not check out on me. If you are past a season of parenting young kiddos, and you're supporting your children as they raise children, we bless that. Like, you are the people that have gone before, and like, you know some of the places of struggle or challenge, and you can help your kids lead their children and maybe do some of those things better. If you do have kids, if you don't have kids, you should be being discipled, you should be discipling others. This is a thing that should be happening, that we should be engaging in as believers in the church. If someone is discipling you, you should be able to recall hopefully several, but at least one moment where that person who's discipling you has said, mm, I don't know if that thing in your life is great. Let's talk about this thing you said or this thing that you did. And not with shame, but with conviction. Like that's supposed to be happening. Correction is supposed to happen in the family of God. Ecclesiastes 7.5 says it's better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. So don't be a yes-man to those that you disciple or to your children. You are supposed to lead them. So largely today we're going to hang out in 2 Chronicles. And uh, First and Second Chronicles were originally just chronicles, but they were split in two because of scroll length. Nothing was taken out. It was just, it was so long. What we see in Chronicles is a lot of what we see in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. You're going to be like, oh, some of these stories and people are the same. But the cool thing about Chronicles is that it was written with some perspective. So it was written a couple hundred years after, and, and they told these stories. They focused on kings in the line of David. Um, we see highlights of kings that did a great job. They, they were faithful to God. They, they did wonderful things, and they're celebrated in Chronicles. Then we also see some highlights of kings that were not so great in Chronicles. So it's this Bible Project refers to it as a series of character studies, and I really like that. I like that idea. So the writer of Chronicles, with all that perspective, is calling people to hope. The writer of Chronicles is saying, like, I see you guys have gone through this stuff. You've had some good kings. You've had some bad kings. You hoped that the Messiah would come, and you would be living under his peaceful rule with a rebuilt temple, all of these things, and it hasn't happened yet. And I know you're disappointed, and you wanted it to be in your time, <laughs> but it's not, so hold on, stay faithful. And that's a lot of what we see in Hebrews too, right? Like, because just like the Jews were longing for the Messiah to come, we have, right, like we get to come after the Messiah came, but we are waiting again for a soon coming king. So we can relate to these stories. They're echoes. There's a lot of genealogy in the beginning of Chronicles. I know sometimes when we read those, we're like, and a crazy name, and a crazy name, and stuff I can't pronounce, and like you go through all of it, like I understand, and you're like, I'm going to check out, like I'm going to skip this part, but when we think about why is that there, because the point, especially in Chronicles, the point is to learn from the people that went before you, and that's what we should also do. I'm sure you can look at your family line and say, well, like this person that went before me, they did this really well, like and I celebrate that, but like, you could probably also come up with some things that they did not do very well. So if we want to realize the mistakes and the brokenness and celebrate the good stuff of those that came before us, we have to look at those that came before us. It's not judgment, it's just good to look at it. That's what we're doing in Chronicles, and, and that's what we should do with our families. So we're going to talk about Jehoshaphat. He was a king of Judah. We see stories about him in Second Chronicles. And one of the things, like, when it first starts talking about him in Chronicles, it talks about how he removed some of the Asherah poles that were used for idol worship. They were like this pagan religion. And, and so he got rid of some of that, which was good. He celebrated for that. 
I'm also sure it probably made him unpopular with some people because when we speak against something that the world likes, we can say like, that's not good, it's not true. We, we love those people, like God loves and pursues those people and wants relationship with them, even if they're engaging in, name anything you want to name here that's, you know, a cycle of sin in the world, but it's wrong. People get uncomfortable. It upsets them. And so he probably faced some of that. So in 2 Chronicles 20, we see that Jehoshaphat gets word that there's an army on their way, and it's like from three distant lands, and so he's scared, and he starts crying out to God for help. We see so many times in scripture, like, people get scared, or they get angry, or afraid, like, whatever, and then they do a bunch of stuff that they shouldn't do before they're finally like, oh, I should have gone to God first. Well, Jehoshaphat, he does that. He goes to God first. So he turns to God. He invites people into it, and he tells the people to fast and pray so that the Lord might help them. So, I mean, that's parenting advice. That's leadership advice right there, right? Like, he got rid of the Asherah pole, so he got rid of stuff that didn't honor God. And, and then when things were tough, he cried out to God. He went to God first. He didn't have all that delay and messy stuff that he had to repent for in the middle. He went to God first. And then he fasted and prayed and invited the people into it. And as parents, as people that disciple, we should do that same thing. So with young kids, you know, you're not going to have your six-year-old fast, right? <laughs> but, but you might say, like, I'm fasting. Here's a basic explanation of what that means. We're hungering for God. Like, if we're mature Christians, like, if you're new to the faith, like, definitely let's talk about fasting. But if you're a mature Christian and you aren't occasionally fasting to pursue God more, you should be. <laughs> It, it brings so much richness to your life. So obviously, fasting looks very different whether you're parenting young children or teenagers. A teenager, you can invite into that. Obviously, like, we're aware of eating disorders, stuff like that. Please use discernment. Obviously, like, God's going to lead you, but invite your kids into it. So then Jehoshaphat gets this gathering of people together, and it's public, and he says, I don't know what to do, but God does, so let's pray. So they're praying. And then the spirit of the Lord comes on someone in the group, and that person gives a word from God and says, like, God's going to deliver us. It's going to be okay. Like, we're, we're going to win. So Jehoshaphat, he understands the value of worship and setting God in his rightful place. So he sends the singers out ahead of the army. So me and Tommy and Cheryl <laughs> sent out ahead of the people with weapons. <laughs> And I kind of love that. Actually, the lady that, um, her name's Shelly Harris, that I study voice with for a while, she, uh, that's her, this is her favorite verse, so I'm going to read it. Second Chronicles 20, 21, and 22. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord, his faithful love endures forever. And at the very moment that they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Mam and Moab and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. At the very moment that they started praising, at the very moment that they put God in their rightful place in their situation, God delivered them. How beautiful is that? Like, just, just that verse. Like, at the very moment that they began to sing and give praise. And if only that verse could get into you so that it comes out of you in the moment when you feel like a lot of stuff's coming against you, at the very moment, sorry, I just had a thought, there was a thing a lot of years ago, and I remember being in this room and like just some heavy stuff going on in my life, and um, we had a group in to lead worship that night, I didn't write this, this is just a right now thing, um, there was a group that had come in from another church leading worship, and so um, it was great. I got to just be, and I remember there was this moment where I went from feeling sorry for myself to praising God and just being like, you know what? I know, God, <laughs> that you are bigger than all of these things. I know what place you belong in, and like it, it changed the trajectory of me walking through that situation. So they praise God. They lead the battle with worship, and then they win, and they gather in this place called, called the Valley of Blessing. Because God gave them favor, because God showed up, they, they like humbled themselves. They weren't like, oh, we won, like, we're going to like lord it over them. Like, no, they went to a place that was a valley and worshiped. So, we also have to mention, there's like a caveat to Jehoshaphat's leadership here. 
2 Chronicles 20, 32, 33. Jehoshaphat was a good king, right? Like, that's good. Like, we've seen all these excellent things that he did. Following the ways of his father Asa, who was also hailed as a good king, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. 33, during his reign, however, he failed to remove all the pagan shrines, and the people never fully committed themselves to follow the God of their ancestors. He did not deal with all the things. I know the heaviness of having a conversation with someone that, that believes very much that their, their worldly way is right. And you can do it with all the love and all of the kindness, but if they're deceived, they can't see it. And so, you know, he's dealing with all these people that are deceived. He probably feels extremely frustrated, and he's like, I, I mean, I'll just, I'm just going to let them have their things. Like, I'm just going to leave these. I don't want to have those fights because I already had those fights. But the Bible says he failed to remove all the pagan shrines and the people never fully committed themselves to follow the God of their ancestors. The stuff he didn't deal with had generational consequences. If you are a parent, the most important people you disciple are your children. And I know, like, I know how much stuff there is to do in a day and in life and with work. I get it. I, like, I really get it. But the most important people you're discipling are your children. Um, can you put up the picture of our family, Sam? Um, that's my family. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the all. Uh, that's my handsome husband, Jeremiah. And then Hadley, who's coming up on 13. Juniper, who's going to be 10 next Saturday. Winnie, who is seven, and Jet, who turned five in July. And then um, those are our dogs, who are the worst behaved individuals in our house. <laughs> and actually, our uh, pet sitter for Tuesday through Thursday just fell through because he dropped a chainsaw on his foot. So if you want to watch dogs, um, that is not a joke. <laughs> So I get it. Like, I get that life is busy, right? We've just kind of gotten past that, like, fit. we're past diapers, we're past the, like, baby, baby stuff. But it turns out you don't actually start getting more sleep. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you just adjust to it. Parents, amen. Yes? So when we look at the idea of a nuclear family, when we talk about the chain reactions that happen when we make choices for our kids and choices in our marriage and choices for our family. You know, we can kind of think about how if, uh, uh, put that picture of the cell up. So, right, we talk about nuclear and we talk about chain reactions, but I also think we can look at our family like a cell. You guys like Tony's pic uh, pickle picture with the face, so when I was picking a picture of a cell, I liked the face because it reminded me of Tony's pickle. So, if we think about, if our family's a cell, and God is the nucleus, he's got the headphones, like he's telling us what to do, right? Like when to reproduce, like he gives us life and he, and he is the one who kind of orchestrates things. That's what we should be listening to for direction. But I think about parents or if you're, if you're discipling someone, you can help someone build their own membrane. But as parents, we are the membrane, especially when our kids are young. We have the privilege of deciding what comes in and what goes out. It's the nucleus that kind of tells the, the membrane, like, hey, get this toxic thing out. Bring this nutritious thing in. And so, uh, also, you know, if, if we look at a um, cell and we think about, like, that, like, there's all these, like, little ridges and things. So, like, we think about the decisions and... Um, I, I love that God has even built just pictures of himself into the smallest building block in our life. So, parents, think about yourselves like the membrane. We're going to use that metaphor a little bit. So whether or not you deal with your past, whether or not you deal with any trauma you've experienced and allow God into those things, and whether or not you surrender generational sin in your family to God is going to have a chain reaction. When I say generational sin, if that feels unfamiliar to you, I'm going to explain it this way. If you have seen a lot of alcoholism, like, you're like, yeah, my grandpa was an alcoholic, his grandpa was an alcoholic. Like, if you see that through your family line, that's often generational sin. We see a lot of conversation about that in the Old Testament, but it's just this thing that we, we want to look at our ancestors. We want to look at our lineage, and if we see, like, we see hoarding, or we see pornography, or we see sexual sin, or whatever that thing is that you're like, oh, yeah, like, my mom, her mom, like, look at your family. 
Kind of just, even if you do like a family tree and you look at it and you say, wow, I never realized that this brokenness carried through all these pieces of my family. So if you are here this morning and you're, you're struggling with alcoholism, I know some amazing people in this congregation that have walked through that and walk with Jesus and walk closely with him now, they would love to help you. If there's something else, like one of those things I said, or something popped into your head immediately and you're like, oh, yeah, there is this thing in my family. Get that root out. <laughs> Don't be like Jehoshaphat. Get all that stuff out so that your children and their children can receive the blessing from you removing that thing from your family line. God wants to fulfill you and empower you to do that. And he will, and, and we would love to partner with you in that because God does redeem and restore. When Jeremiah and I think about what comes in and out of the cell of our family, I think about Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's a good way to decide what comes into our cell, right? We don't want to be entertained by things that Jesus died for. We don't want to watch shows or listen to music or like whatever source of media you might think of, books that glorify sex outside of marriage or violence or racism. Like, pick a thing. If, if Jesus died for it, Really think about how it's being framed in something you watch. Is there Bible, is there sex and violence and all these things in the Bible? Yes, but it's framed in the appropriate way. It's framed everything unto God. It's not being glorified, right? Uh, we use in our family, just a practical note, we use uh, Common Sense Media and we use uh, IMDB, the parent guide. Like, it will list out, like, every single instance of any kind of sexual content, every single bit of violence. It will also list out every curse word <laughs> that is in a movie because if you don't want to be surprised when you're sitting there with your kids. Now, are there times we actually um, had a dinner with someone a few weeks ago? It was none of you. And the, the F word got dropped a few times, like, and our kids were at the table, and we were like, it's not that they've never, ever heard it before, but, like, when we left, we were like, hey, we don't say that word, like, <laughs> just a reminder. And so, yes, there are times when we have to frame things, and we can't necessarily control everything that comes in and out of that membrane, right? But when we do, don't ignore it. Deal with it. Have the conversation at an age-appropriate level. And also, um, if you are a parent, these books are so good. Um, if you're like, I love talking to my kids about sex, and this is like the most exciting part of parenting for me, this is not for you. You've probably got it down. But if you're like, you know what? This is not my favorite conversation. These are like age appropriate. We use them with our kids. I think they're great. Um, three to five, so very simple, just like body part kind of stuff, mostly. And uh, then there's another one, five to eight, eight to 12, and 12 to 16, all with like biblical perspective, and actually I bought this set, so like if you have a kid in one of those age ranges, come see me, I will give it to you. Um, but they're awesome, just a side note. So the other thing that we're really specific about is music, and I know we can kind of say, well, that's a secular thing and this is a sacred thing, but like you have a relationship with Jesus, if you have a relationship with Jesus and you're here, he has made you holy and he is holy and you are a supernatural being and so everything is sacred. So separating lyrics, I'm going to read you some, you might know who they are and you might be into this, but I'm going to read them to you in this context because I want you to think about if this is what you want your young girl perhaps singing. I've got a long list of ex-lovers, they'll tell you I'm insane but I've got a blank space, baby, and I'll write your name. Do you want that discipling your kid? It's very popular right now. We've had conversations with our kids, um, especially like, you know, Hadley's almost 13, and uh, she's around non-church kids, though we homeschool. Uh, and so we've had conversations about like, all right, we're gonna like look at the lyrics. Let's look at the lyrics together. Let's read this. Do you think this honors God? Do you think it honors who God created you to be? 
I, re I realize it's tense. Like, I know this is a thing, because it is comfortable to turn that stuff on in the car. And, like, I listen to, like, non-worship music sometimes. But I, mostly, like, that's what I want coming into me. And if I do listen to it, I'm very conscious of the lyrics, because I just feel like that's a deep conviction in my heart. And Proverbs 18.21 says that there is power of life and death in the tongue. So, in other words, what we say... <laughs> It, it speaks to us. It shapes us. And when we're saying those words, there's a lot of power in that. Steve Burr, a few weeks ago, and I love that he did this, um, with the middle school kiddos, talked about, they mentioned, like, he was like, what artist do you like to listen to? And, you know, they told him some of those. And he was like, okay, here's a Christian artist that kind of has a similar sound, and it's going to speak life to you. It's going to speak good things. It's going to remind you of who you are in God, because I will tell you, the world would love to tell your children who they are. It would. The world wants to tell me who I am. And, and there's this false, like, promise in it, like, that this is going to bring you joy. It's going to make you happy. It's going to feel good. This is love. But that's, God has more for you. So let it be God that's shaping you. Let it be God that's shaping your children. And if you're a parent and you're like, you know, these ideas, they're really nice in theory. Like, I see what you're saying. And like, that's fine for you. But I don't have time for that. Like, I'm busy. I'm stressed. You don't know my kids. You don't know my job. You don't know my spouse. Like, I'm going to say to you that I think one of those things is maybe you're living in your own strength. When I start my day and I don't start my day in the Word, if I, if I hop on email or, like, um, social media is part of, like, the business that we run. Like, if I'm, like, responding to messages, like, I start out stressed. I start out already, like, a little bit too intense, a little bit too hyper. And honestly, I don't fully get back to that place. God is gracious, but I don't fully get back to that best place that is the same as when I start the day with the Lord and in the Word. And even if it's a few minutes— if you are not starting your day with God, you are not going to react well to your children or your job or these responsibilities. And I'm also going to say, maybe you need to, like, consider your priorities. Not just that first thing in the morning, but what are you telling your kids is valuable? Their travel baseball team, their travel soccer team, it won't get them into heaven. And your kid Maybe they're going to, like, go to the Olympics or pray, play professionally, but, like, may the Lord's grace be on that, and you don't miss church on a Sunday for it. Because what you're telling your kid when you choose that on a Sunday is church, like, church is good. Like, we'll go when we can, and it's nice to be there. But when it's not convenient or when, you know, you have a soccer game, like, we're going to do that instead. I get the temptation, I do, because you want to give your kid opportunities. I understand. But... When your kid, later in their life, loses someone they love, or their marriage is in trouble, or someone in their family is sick, where do you want them to go? Soccer, yes, Jesus. Soccer and baseball will not be there for them. But the family of God will. Now, if you're still kind of like, my life is too full, like, I just, I can't even, I'm going to tell you, and I don't say this to glorify myself, but I say it because I want you to understand that I really do, <laughs> I understand having to give things up and hold things with an open hand, and I do understand what it is to be busy. If you're close to me, you probably know that, but we have four kids, two badly behaved but very nice looking dogs. Um, I get to do what I do here, which is such a gift. I love it. Um, we run a business. Uh, I'm a police chaplain for our town. I also... Um, teach some swim lessons because I love it. Specifically, I like teaching adults. It's really cool to see an adult who's never been able to swim before learn to swim. It's a really cool thing. Um, and a few years ago, I had, I had to cut out the ones that I was teaching inside. They did give us a free pool membership, but the hours were kind of funny, so it wasn't like super beneficial to my kids. And um, I just knew like this is the thing that God's asking me to kind of get rid of, and I did. Uh, I, still, I still teach them in the summer because the pool's open all the time. It gets my kids in the pool. I want them to be proficient swimmers. My youngest were kind of on the cusp. Um, and I swim, so, like, it's good for my body and my mind 
but we have to choose things. We have to hold them with an open hand. If God asked me to give that up next summer, like, I would have to do that. Psychologists and therapists for parents most often report being asked, what do I do when? So situational things. But I don't think that's the question that we should be asking because things are going to come. I think parents shouldn't be asking, what do I do when? I think they should be asking, what is shaping me and what is shaping my child? Because I can go through a traumatic experience and that traumatic experience can shape me or I can be shaped by God as I walk through that thing. Same thing for your kid. They can go to school and it can shape them, or God can shape them. You can be intentional in their discipleship, and then they go to school, but they're already shaped. And part of that is you have to live so intentionally and so humbly and so attractively that your kids want to be that thing that they see at home. If your faith on a Monday, does not look any different than it did on Saturday before you came to church on Sunday, your kids are going to see that it's empty. If your faith is empty or if your life is empty, if there's no Jesus on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and all the way to Saturday before you come to church on Sunday, your kids' lives are not going to change because they don't see yours changing. So what's the point? And finally, I'm going to talk about marriage. If you are married and parenting children, your kids don't come first. Your marriage does. It has to. One day those little people are going to leave your house, God willing, <laughs> and you're left there. I love them. It's a gift and a joy, but, you know, one day they're going to leave. And when they do, it's going to be you guys. <laughs> it's going to be you guys. It's just you with that person. And if you're in the midst of parenting a baby baby like it's exhausting be kind to the other person parents like to do this thing where they're like I didn't get any sleep last night and they're like well I didn't get any sleep either well I only got two hours of sleep well I only got an hour and 45 like try like this is where we can choose to have grace if you're a parent you've parented a newborn you know that argument and like we still have it sometimes the dog woke me up three times well you know so and so gotten got at the end of my bed one day you're going to miss that noise and that busyness, but one day you will also be in your home without your children there every night and every morning. Go look at your kids when they're sleeping. Be reminded of how wonderful they are because when they get up in the morning and they complain about the eggs that you lovingly scrambled and paired with like expensive sourdough from a local bakery or, or they don't put away the shoes you've asked them to put away four times in the last 20 minutes, or, or whatever it is. Obviously, these stories are not based on real instances. <laughs> but when you do those, like, go look at your kid when they're sleeping, because in the morning when they do those annoying things, you're going to be like, oh, but remember, like, I love them so much. <laughs> God probably looks at us when we're sleeping, too. <laughs> The Lord said to be fruitful and multiply. Children are always a blessing. Have children. Raise children. Do these things. You will see so much of God as you parent and as you invest in your relationship with him. But you also see so much of God in your marriage. Don't forget to invest in your marriage. Do the things that make your marriage healthy. <laughs> Give your spouse compliments. Ask your spouse how they're doing. Have sex. <laughs> Do the things that we're supposed to do. Yes, whoever said amen. Uh, I have a couple book recommendations for that amener and everyone else in the room who's married. Um, Beautiful Union by Joshua Ryan Butler. I'm not all the way through it, but it's very good and very theologically sound. Would highly recommend. And then uh, Married Sex, Gary Thomas and Deborah Falada. Great book. Read it with your spouse. Like, it, and it doesn't have to be like necessarily reading together, but like, hey, we're going to read chapter one before Wednesday. And then... You get to practice those things if you're married. <clears throat> so after God, put your marriage first. You are discipling your children by working on your relationship. If you have a healthy marriage, your kids are going to look for a healthy marriage. If you have a disaster of a marriage, and then later your kid, say your daughter brings home a boy, and you're like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> Maybe it's you. 
You disciple your children by the way that you live. You disciple your children by the way that you protect them and care for them and invite their friends in. You disciple your children with your marriage, the way that you talk about your boss, all of these things. You are discipling your kids whether you realize it or not. So be intentional in the shaping. Have conversations in the car about spiritual things. Talk about what God's teaching you. If your kid's old enough, do the same Bible plan. Read a book together. Do these things. Live like you mean it. You are also not an unending well. There is an end to your energy. There is an end to your ability to answer 10 million questions in the car. One of my children's in here. Who's my question asker. It's okay to say, I'm feeling really anxious or I'm feeling really stressed or like, I just need quiet for a second. Give me 10 minutes. You're also discipling your children by how you handle technology. If your kid comes in a room and you're on your phone and in a wasting time situation specifically, which if you don't do that, Rick Waddle bless you, but if you don't waste time on your phone, <laughs> that's great. But most of us probably do. And if it's a time-wasting situation, put it down, listen to your kid. What do they want to show you? How do they want to interact with you? If a kid walks in and I'm on my phone doing something that is like important and I need to finish, I will say, I really want to hear what you have to say. Give me just one second. I need to finish this email or I need to finish this text or I need to finish this post for Grace Shack, whatever the thing is. And then I absolutely want to hear it. Communicate with your kid because you're also discipling them in whether or not technology is more important than they are. So Jehoshaphat's leader, leadership advice, we're going to come back to it. Get rid of the stuff that doesn't honor God in your family. When things are tough, go to God first. Fast, pray, invite your family into it, lead them in it. Be humble, live a life that's attractive, that your kids want to live something like that, and recognize God's sovereignty. Stand with me. Now, there are some prompts on the screen that you can kind of reflect on, but I'm going to, as the team comes back up, I'm going to encourage you to go get your communion elements and come back to your seat because we're going to do that together today.